Chapter 12, Mineral and Soil Resources. Copper Basin, Tennessee is, again, one of the, unfortunately, too many examples of areas that were negatively impacted by things that we do to it. In this case, smelting. Mining practices uh, typically in back in those days involved cutting down trees all around the area where the smelter was to use it to fire the smelters. So on top of cutting down trees in the area, basically um, removing all of the trees within a certain area, then you also got all of the <clears throat> emissions that are created by the actual smelter, typically uh, sulfur dioxide is a result of the smelting process, which then of course creates <clears throat> air pollution. And when then that sulfur dioxide combines in the atmosphere with water vapor, we create acid precipitation like we've spoken about already. And basically this area was ecologically ruined in just uh, a few years uh, of, of doing this process. Even though this stopped a long, long time ago, that area is still in the process of trying to reclaim that area. And they anticipate that it could take another 100 plus years to fully detoxify that area to the point where the natural vegetation can start growing back. We actually did a lot of that around the Redding area, smelting. Um, Back before Shasta Dam, smelters were in the area and people commented on how, how bad the process smelled. And, uh, and uh, of course, you look around Shasta Lake and you can see areas, even still today, where the trees really haven't grown back in the area immediately surrounding the smelter. Uh, and again, at least that's <clears throat> partially due to the, the emissions that were generated, all of the toxins that were generated. So this chapter covers quite a few different topics that probably in a perfect world I would separate into separate chapters so that we could cover each in, uh, in really enough detail to fully understand them. But anyway, uh, this chapter starts off talking a little bit about plate tectonics and the rock cycle. Keeping in mind, of course, that um, geology, <clears throat> as well as all of the other topics we're covering in this class, are an important part of understanding the bigger picture. So we do have to know a little bit about geology to be a good environmental scientist. Some terminology first, starting off with lithosphere, which is the Earth's outermost layer that basically is composed of rock and it's composed uh, across the earth of seven large plates. If we go below the lithosphere, <clears throat> we go to what's called the asthenosphere, which is a region where the mantle below the earth's surface starts getting hot and it's soft. So because of the heat, rock isn't really solid and hard like we're used to seeing it here on the surface of the earth. And that region also contains a few more sort of floating plates, plates that move around. Basically, the continents, as we can see them from looking at a, a map of the Earth, are situated on some of these plates. And if you've ever seen any, any of the programs on television that talk about um, geology and, and the movement of the Earth's plates, Going way back in time, we basically had one large land mass on the Earth. And over time, those plates have moved and created the, the continents, uh, the land masses as we know them today. But they are still moving. Uh, as time goes on, they will continue to move. It's just at such a small distance, such a slow pace, that it's, not, um, it's nothing we'll see in our lifetime as being really different. So you might want to refer to the image 
that just gives you the visual uh, orientation going from the surface crust of the earth uh, down through the asthenosphere and then the lower mantle eventually reaching the inner core of the earth which is solid iron and nickel but again generally as scientists we're most at least as environmental scientists we're most interested in the uh, the two outer layers of the earth's crust because they influence uh, kind of what we see and what we do here on the surface so plate tectonics is the study of how these plates move and how they form the earth's crust and ultimately this movement explains how features that we see on the surface of the earth have originated whether we're talking about the mountain ranges or uh, or any of the other physical features of the earth's surface where things start to kind of get interesting for for us even as non-scientists are areas where plate boundaries are located in other words where two plates come together these areas I say they are interesting to all of us because it's at these areas where we have pretty intense geologic activity areas where earthquakes occur areas where volcanoes are common and certainly uh, those of us living in California are pretty aware of, of these items we have a lot of fault uh, uh, faults <coughs> located throughout California which are prone to periodic earthquakes and then certainly between Mount Lassen Mount Shasta and all of the other large mountain ranges uh, large mountains as we move north into Washington we have currently or past active volcanoes uh, throughout our area volcanoes that have erupted in the recent past like Mount St. Helens and volcanoes that are likely to erupt again in the future it's just a matter of how long or how far into the future so this figure shows global plate boundaries the boundaries of those primary plates that we've uh, mentioned earlier and again particularly of note are the North American plate and the Pacific plate which converge right along the western coastline of North America particularly from California all the way up into Canada and Alaska of, of note uh, among those uh, faults al along these plate boundaries are the San Andreas fault just because of how large it is there are lots of other fault lines though located throughout California but again this is kind of one that most of us are probably familiar with at least by name if you track the red line that kind of goes up the coast up through Alaska and then west towards the Eurasian plate and then south and, and above the Australian plate and back around that whole area is called the ring of fire basically the area around the Pacific plate and it's called the ring of fire because again there are lots of active volcanoes that rim this entire area and so again that gets that name that convergent boundary gets that name because of how active it is with respect to volcanic activity but you can see there are plenty of other areas around the uh, world that are uh, that are active or potentially active with convergent or divergent boundaries transform boundaries and so we'll talk about each of these plate boundaries briefly keep in mind that all three of these types of boundaries occur both in the ocean and on land so no specific boundary is tied to only being in the ocean or only being on land it's more about that they are different with respect to how they move so any two plates that uh, that we have on this planet that are next to each other basically move relative to each other and when we have two plates that are moving away from each other as in this image 
we have what's called a divergent plate boundary. And as these plates move away from each other, for example, along this mid-ocean uh, ridge, where we have a rift zone, and we have two plates moving away from each other, what that results in, basically, is a way, a space or an opening, for magma to rise up from the core of the Earth. So we can have magma rising to the surface. And if it's underwater, as in uh, this image, basically the result of this are equivalent to sort of underwater volcanic eruptions or underwater leakages of liquid rock. That rock then solidifies and it'll either form, again, a ridge of uh, hard landscape under the ocean or if it builds up enough then it can actually poke above the water and create islands. Islands like the Hawaiian Islands were formed uh, by this type of a process. And so that's why new islands are always being formed. At least there's always that potential that a new island can be formed along a divergent plate boundary. When we have two plates colliding or pushing against each other, moving towards each other, we can actually have what's called a convergent plate boundary. And typically, um, there are two ways this can occur. Subduction, which is illustrated um, uh, on this image, where we have a subduction zone because one plate is being pushed towards the other one and it's actually being pushed under the other one. And what that can result in then is an uplifting and the creation of things like mountain ranges. So this collision um, can ultimately create a mountain range, which would um, you know, be the case for a lot of mountain ranges that are uh, near these plate boundaries. So sometime in the past, when a plate boundary like this was moving um, pretty rapidly, a mountain range could have been formed uh, and it might still be building now. Again, it may just be growing millimeters a year. So these kinds of things, again, are still today affecting mountain ranges, mountains that are growing uh, because they're still near a subduction zone. Then the third option is that we can have two plates that are moving parallel to each other in opposite directions. And if this is the case, then we have what's called a transform plate boundary. So again, we can have two plates that are moving. They're not moving towards or away from each other, but rather they're moving parallel to each other and can create what again is called a transform fault. So as these plates are moving, they may not be moving constantly. The pressure might be building up as these plates are forced together and eventually when there's enough tension then suddenly those plates may shift suddenly uh, and it may not be that much that they move but again it's this process where those plates have friction and the uh, the movement may not be happening constantly at a small amount the movement typically will happen in, in kind of small sudden movements which then create earthquakes Again, as I also mentioned, volcanoes are, are typical um, occurrences around very active areas. So there are certainly um, movement of tectonic plates that cause volcanic activity. Anytime you have a shifting of the Earth's crust and you create a place for the magma that's trapped below it to spill to the surface, then you have that potential to have some type of volcanic activity. It could be a full-blown, large-scale eruption, or it could be a lot of other activity that, uh, that occurs because of that that isn't as devastating as, again, say, a full-blown volcanic eruption. Also, just to, to clarify a couple of terms, we've probably all heard the terms magma and lava, it's important to realize magma 
is basically um, rock that has become liquid down below the surface of the earth. So heat that's generated down in the asthenosphere basically is hot enough to melt rock that's in that area. And so that melted rock is called magma. It's only called lava once it actually gets to the surface of the earth. Again, it's the same thing. It's, it's liquid rock, but it's called magma when it's below the surface and lava when it reaches the surface. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, we have the subduction zones kind of between North America and Asia that I mentioned was called the Ring of Fire. That's one uh, area of, of active volcanic um, activity in subduction zones. Then we also have another area of volcanoes spreading centers in the uh, Iceland and the Mid-Atlantic Rift Zone. You can refer back to the map if you need to. And then we also have above hot spots, volcan uh, volcanoes that are created above hot spots, which could be those undersea openings in the Earth's crust. So again, we have volcanoes occur when we have subduction zones, like we do here. We have them occurring in areas that are uh, what we call, again, spreading centers, where areas are moving away from each other. And then we also have volcanoes created above these hot spots. So earthquakes are basically forces that are inside the earth where we have stretching and pushing of the lithosphere, typically, again, created along fault lines. Rocks will absorb the energy, like I mentioned. They'll, they'll kind of absorb some of that movement, but then all of a sudden they just can't resist that force any longer. It will shift or break, and that sudden release of energy is what call, causes the seismic waves, again, what we typically think of as an earthquake. And in general, these earthquakes occur along faults or places where the Earth's crust is fractured, where rocks move, uh, and again, typically these are at plate boundaries, at or, or near plate boundaries. Just as perspective, about a million earthquakes every year, and they're measured probably, again, something we're familiar with, the Richter scale, which is a um, scale that measures the magnitude of a uh, earthquake. One million earthquakes a year, I don't know, may or may seem like a lot or may not seem like many. I don't know if any of you have ever gone to the USGS website, the United States Geological Survey website. You could even Google something like uh, California earthquakes. And there are maps that you can look at that show not only the location, but the, uh, the size, the magnitude of, of earthquakes. And you might be surprised just how many are happening every day in California. Most of them are so small that we don't feel them, or uh, again, they may be located in areas where we, where we don't live. But there are a lot of really active areas in California besides maybe the obvious, like the coastline, the California coastline around the Bay Area. We typically think of that as being active, or maybe down in the Los Angeles area. And both of those areas are certainly active with respect to earthquakes, but um, big ski area, Mammoth Lakes, uh, on that side of the Sierra Nevada is a very, very active um, seismic region. If you look at the earthquake activity over there, there may be dozens a day just in that area. Again, most of them are fairly small, but, uh, but there are lots of them occurring. Even around Redding, there are a few fault lines uh, in the foothills around Redding. And there are earthquakes there on a pretty regular basis, but again, usually they're pretty small, so most of us never feel them. In addition to that, of course, it's not only the potential damage that's done by the actual earthquake. If it's bad enough and if the ground shakes enough, it can destroy 
structures. But really, the side effects can be almost as bad or worse in some cases. Landslides where we have avalanches of rock or movement of soil uh, down slopes. We also have, especially when earthquakes occur out in the ocean, under the surface of the ocean, we can generate tsunamis that, in the worst case scenario, have a much greater potential to kill people and do damage. Uh, than typically an earthquake or a volcano by itself. The second half of this geology portion of this chapter deals with the rock cycle. So again, we've talked about other cycles, carbon, uh, water cycle. We also uh, need to understand the rock cycle because ultimately it affects things like building soil. And without soil, without building soil and replenishing soil as it's eroded, naturally or because of us, we wouldn't be able to grow plants. We wouldn't be able to grow plants for our food. The habitat wouldn't be there for wildlife. And ultimately, that means we wouldn't do so well trying to live on this planet. So rocks then are, are basically aggregates or, or groups of one or more minerals. And they are broken down into three basic types or categories of rock. Igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. We'll talk about uh, each of those types of rock in a little more detail in this chapter. The rock cycle itself involves rocks moving from one physical state or being transformed from one physical state or from one location to another. You can imagine that the process of building rock, again, the, the creation magma getting to the surface and hardening, and then the process of, of weathering that rock from big chunks of rock to small little particles of rock is a very slow process. So the rock cycle occurs at a much slower pace than any of the other cycles that we've talked about in this class. And again, that's why uh, we're talking about this in the geologic section of this chapter. A geologic time scale might be millions of years. And again, that's why it's hard many times for humans to understand things um, related to processes like um, you know, weathering of rock because it happens very, very slowly. So this figure does a good job of, of summarizing not only what the three categories of rock are, but also kind of their relationship to each other. So igneous rocks like basalt are basically formed because of that magma getting to the surface and then that lava, which is what magma becomes, uh, cooling down and hardening. So again, ig igneous rock basically is fresh out of the Earth's core, although again, this rock could still be millions and millions of years old. But again, basalt is a, is a type of uh, igneous rock. As that igneous rock, like basalt, continues to get weathered by wind erosion, by rain, by the other forces of nature that, uh, that, that impact rock, sitting here on the surface of the earth, snow, glacier movement, those kinds of things. Um, basically that rock is, is eroded away, it's moved and it's deposited in other places. So for example, from a higher spot to a lower spot on a mountain range. And over time, as that rock is compacted, so you have um, you know, soil building on it, just the weight of the rock compacting itself. You form over, again, a long period of time, the other type of rock, which is called sedimentary rock. And sandstone is a type of sedimentary rock. Then if you further uh, uh, expose that uh, sedimentary rock to chemicals, all the minerals and all the chemical uh, chemical sort of reactions that occur here on the surface of the earth along with heating and pressure 
you ultimately form the third type of rock, which is metamorphic rock. Uh, an example would be quartzite, which is derived, uh, a metamorphic rock, which is derived from sandstone. Now notice that igneous rock with enough heating and pressure and chemical action can be uh, transformed directly to metamorphic rock. Again, given enough time. And that metamorphic rock, given enough weathering and movement and compaction, can be uh, transformed into sedimentary rock. So all three of these rock types, although ultimately they're, they're dependent on being formed by magma reaching the surface of the earth, all three of these types of rocks um, can uh, create the other types of rocks. You can't create igneous rock from the other types because that's created from lava, magma that reaches the surface. But uh, metamorphic rock can create sedimentary. Sedimentary can create metamorphic. Igneous can create either one of those as well. So now, kind of to put this in perspective, we have a, a, a area of science called economic geology, where basically we are focused on understanding and utilizing minerals that we deem as being useful to us as humans. So what are minerals? Minerals are elements or compounds that occur naturally in the Earth's crust. These are always considered to be non-renewable resources. They may have been formed a long, long, long time ago, but they also take a very long time to create, to be created. And so that ultimately means that they are not um, renewable. Once we use them up, they are gone forever. Some minerals are very, very abundant and probably will never run out of them. Others we just don't have very much use for, so we probably will never run out of those. But we start looking at other highly desirable minerals, things like copper or platinum or other minerals that we have uh, or, or have created economic value for. You know, there, there's always the potential that, that if we keep exploiting those resources that they could run out. So again, there's a huge list of, of minerals that have economic value to us, even sand and gravel. We might think of what kind of economic value does sand have, but how many products contain sand? Quite, quite a few, actually. Silicone. Um, you know, a lot of computer products are, are kind of derived indirectly from sand. Um, you know, sand and, and gravel used to make things like concrete or mortar, or cement, which are really a very standard building block for our society. Uh, and then other minerals that are combined together uh, to be used for some manufacturing process. So again, rocks are mixtures of minerals, and then what we call ore, like we talk about iron ore or some type of copper ore, are basically rock mixtures that contain large enough concentrations of a mineral to make it worth our being able to extract them and use them. Certainly there are a lot of other minerals that we value or that we have some economic value for. But generally, if they're not in ore, meaning, again, they're not in large enough concentrations, it's, it's too costly for us to try and extract them. We also then look at ore, whether it's high grade or low grade. High grade having a higher concentration of the mineral we desire or low-grade, having a much lower concentration. The United States and Canada have about 5% of the world's population, as we've mentioned a few times. And we've also mentioned, at least back at the very beginning of the semester, that we use a disproportionately large percentage of the world's 
resources, particularly in, in this case, we're talking about the world's metals, which are, again, basically minerals that we get in ore. There are a lot of developing countries that don't even have really any mineral production. So in many cases, we may be able to provide enough of these minerals uh, in our own country. In many cases, we, um, you know, mine these minerals in other countries. But there are a lot of countries that really don't even mine minerals. That may change over time. There may be a point when um, ore is discovered that contain enough concentrations of desirable minerals that mining may take place. But as of right now, um, that's not the case everywhere. But there's no doubt that as industrialization worldwide continues, and as more and more countries become more developed, and as those countries are no longer able to meet their own demands for, with, with what they can provide for themselves by mining their own minerals, then those countries are going to have to become more and more reliant on buying minerals from other countries. China's at this point right now. And the real danger or the real scary thing here potentially in the future is, is again, once we start, um, you know, mining in other countries, especially those that don't have the same type of environmental laws that the developed countries do, we're, we're going to create the same problems we've already created with, with logging and, and all the other things that we've done that have destroyed um, you know, the environment in those countries, sacrificing the short-term economic benefit for maybe long-term destruction of, of a country's uh, land. So basically, the, the process of um, mineral extraction and, and, and creating something that we value with those minerals involves obviously first locating uh, and identifying a deposit that is uh, economically viable. You know, there will be enough of it there that the money it takes to get it out of the ground will be recuperated by the, uh, the, the amount of mineral that we're able to utilize. And then, of course, once we've located it, we, we mine it, we get it out of the ground. But then that's still only a small part of the process. We still have to refine that mineral, get it out of the, the ore, or uh, you know get it um, separated from other minerals, and then concentrate it so there's again a, enough of a of a level of it to be useful, and then further purification in order to be able to make the products that we uh, that we use those minerals for. So there's a, a, a bit of a figure in your book that's on this slide that just lists a few of those um, more important minerals like aluminum that is used in so much production today, gold that basically backs up the monetary systems, magnesium, mercury, silicone, which is obviously hugely important for our technology, and so forth. So your book talks about each of these steps. Um, extracting minerals involves mining, and typically we either have open pit surface mines, like we see in, um, in these images, strip mines, where we follow the ore, strip the, the ground above it away, follow the vein of the ore uh, until we've exhausted it, and then moving on. So surface mining is, uh, is probably the worst of the types of mining because it disturbs the surface. We remove soil. We remove, obviously, that means we're removing vegetation. And that area basically has been completely impacted where it's no longer of any value for, uh, for, for plants or animals to live on any longer. There is a... a um, 
an important part of this though that now mines, surface mines have to be reclaimed. They have to be filled in. We have to put soil back on them and we have to revegetate them, which wasn't always the case. So, so there is that now that these areas do have to be fixed after mining is done. But certainly while the mining is, is occurring, it's a huge piece of land that may be sacrificed completely for the sake of, of the mining activity. The other way of extracting minerals is through subsurface mining. And that can be accomplished by a shaft mine, typically drilling a shaft more or less straight down and then tapping into the ore, or slope mining, uh, as, as uh, imaged in the, the bottom left of this slide. And then as far as processing those minerals, uh, we mentioned at the beginning of this chapter about the process called smelting, which is when we basically heat whatever ore that we're trying to extract the mineral from at very high temperatures to get rid of all the impurities from the molten liquid metal that we're trying to uh, extract. And again, this process is done in a blast furnace. Uh, we typically add various things um, to this process depending on what exactly we're trying to uh, smelt. And then we remove impurities by mixing them with limestone. Certainly a big part of, of this whole process with respect to extracting and processing and then disposing of all the unwanted waste products or the minerals once we've used them up is that there is a huge external cost. There's a cost for, for, for mining it and manufacturing it and, and there's value in, in you know, selling it. But the external cost we're talking about here is the, the price of disturbing the land, how much damage is done to the land and how much pollution is created pollution that can affect air quality, water quality, pollution that can get into the soil and maybe be there for a very long time. The fact that now it's, it's required by law that, that these things are addressed and it's not cheap to fix these problems. So that cost, again, is going to be passed along to the consumer who buys those products. But really, if if the full cost of completely fixing the environment after mining and all of the damage that's done along the way to the environment is incorporated into the cost of the product that's made, we couldn't afford any of those products. Again, it's so expensive that if the manufacturers had to charge us, the consumers, to completely absorb the costs of the environmental damage, products would be way too expensive. So obviously, um, you know, they, they don't charge us for that full environmental cost. And that's also why environmental regulations are always a balance between what's best for the environment, but also what's best for society and what's best economically. So again, that's kind of an important thing to realize. Despite how much, how much money a company charges you for an automobile, let's say, all of the parts, labor, all of the stuff, the raw materials that have to be mined or manufactured to make a car, if we had to charge, if we were charged all of the cost of those resources to the environment, um, you know, cars would just be way too expensive for anybody to afford except for the very, very wealthy. So now on to the environmental implications from the economic implications. Mining disturbs large amounts of land, like I've already mentioned. In the U.S. alone, current or abandoned mines, metal and, and coal mines, for example, um, take up about 22 million acres of land. Open pit mining not only damages large pieces of land, 
but um, but also uses a lot of other very precious resources like water. Mining has resulted in, in contaminating thousands of streams and rivers in the United States, particularly um, chemicals like sulfuric acid, but even longer lasting things like dissolved lead and arsenic and cadmium, which are heavy metals. But then again, a lot of other dangerous materials that get washed from mines into waterways. We've got the perfect, unfortunately, example of a, a really bad situation just around Reading with the Iron Mountain Mine. You've got all of these different minerals and elements that are under the surface of the earth. And even though they're natural, like lead and arsenic, um, you know, mercury, they're natural elements in the earth, but when they're underground, they're, they're meant to be kind of locked up or, 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 you know, set aside where they don't get to the surface. When we go and dig a big hole in the ground, now we've exposed these elements and when it rains, now those elements can be washed across the surface into the nearest waterway. Whereas again, without mining, they would be kind of locked in place under the surface of the earth. Aside from that, um, mining typically generates a lot of tailings, which are impurities that are kind of left over from processing ore and they're typically left as big piles on the ground uh, near the processing plants where they can leach their toxins into the nearby waterways. And oftentimes these tailings, again, contain things like cyanide, mercury, sulfuric acid that can create very widespread uh, problems. Smelting itself creates air pollution like we've already mentioned. In addition, to the uh, release of lead, cadmium, arsenic, zinc, and other hazardous waste products that can create very, uh, very bad uh, air and water pollution. Plus, and we, in, in addition to the water that we've already talked about, just the amount of water that it takes, uh, processing minerals also require a lot of energy. And so that energy, again, is, is generated by burning fossil fuels. And so when you look at the whole picture of mining, you can create a, a lot of very bad um, environmental impacts that result. The Enviro Discovery in this chapter uses gold um, just as one example of um, of, of a resource that and how much waste and, uh, and, and toxic byproducts that it generates. So just to be able to make enough gold for two wedding rings, the process of mining gold creates six tons of waste. So that's 12,000 pounds of waste cyanide leaching that produces three million pounds of waste for every pound of gold that's produced. And then when you look at the world's largest gold mine, which is actually owned by a US company, but it's in Indonesia, dumps more than 200,000 tons of contaminated tailings into the local river system each day, not in a year, or in, in, you know, months and months, it's every day. So obviously the company is there because that's where the gold is, but they also clearly benefit by, uh, by being in a country where there are probably no environmental regulations that govern this. Again, Indonesia is probably pretty happy to have the income, um, but, uh, but they're not going to sacrifice that for the benefit of the environment because, again, it's an important part of their economy, presumably. So just think about that. 200,000 tons, a ton being 2,000 pounds, so you can do the math and figure out how many pounds of tailings that is every day 
for the world's largest mine. So I mentioned that it is required by law that we restore um, previously mined areas. And basically this would otherwise be what we call derelict land. In other words, once the mine is done, it's no longer profitable. We used to just walk away from it and you'd have this big hole in the ground that was uh, basically just worthless land. It was derelict, meaning it had no more value soil was gone so plants wouldn't grow now again by law we are required to restore that land to prevent further degradation and erosion that can occur because of having exposed uh, you know ground but also then eliminating and, and or neutralizing any of the local toxins and Again, very importantly, making that land productive again for other purposes. Getting soil back on it so that the vegetation can grow back. And so that that land can once again um, have value from an environmental standpoint. To provide habitat for wildlife. And provide all those other ecosystem services we've already talked about. Control erosion, allow for water to percolate and just have a healthy, balanced environment like we see in this image. Restoration is a, again, time-consuming and expensive, complicated process, but ultimately it involves filling in the hole that was left behind, grading it back to the normal topography that it would have been prior to the mining, and then getting vegetation planted to keep that soil in place. Um, again, unfortunately, once we've exposed the surface, subsurface of the ground to, um, to the air, we do get a lot of those toxic or, or nasty sort of things that will leach out. And so there are times when an area has become a bit toxic where we oftentimes have to revegetate it with plants that can tolerate um, you know, being in, in a, a bit of a toxic environment. Given time, uh, you know, these areas can heal themselves, but it may take a long time. And all of this was because of the uh, Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act back in 1977. That requires reclamation after uh, mining of coal. So only if you're mining coal. It does not require that a company reclaim the land if they've mined for other things, only coal. So again, as much coal mining as we do, that's good. But you think of all the other things that we still mine for, and those areas are not necessarily required to be reclaimed. Some companies do it anyway, but uh, that costs money, so they don't all do it. And again, do you think that was the company fighting for that? Probably. Do you think it was um, basically just a thought that, you know, it, it's better for our economy if we don't make these companies pay a lot of money to fix the problem so that their products are cheap enough for us to buy? That was probably uh, some of it as well. All right, on to the, the next big part of this then, soil. So this section will be looking at soil properties and, and the different processes that occur. So first of all, soil is clearly important to us because without soil, vegetation wouldn't have a place to grab onto. There'd be no way for vegetation to be able to get access to moisture and minerals. So, um, so soil is clearly an important aspect for, for us to understand as environmental science. Soil is defined as the uppermost layer of the Earth's crust, which is basically the layer that supports life on the surface of the planet, whether it's plants or ultimately even animals and all those other microscopic things that live on this planet. So ultimately it's the, it's the layer of the Earth's crust that we see, that we walk on, that we grow our food on. So soil is formed by that parent material, so going back to those three types of rock, 
ultimately rock is what forms soil and that's um, what we call parent material it's the rock so just another name for rock but parent material because it's the material that creates or gives birth to soil by slowly breaking down from bigger pieces to smaller and smaller particles and again that that breakdown of rock is accomplished by physical weathering every little raindrop that hits a piece of rock slowly wears it down um, heating and cooling but then of course chemical and biological processes also um, combine to to break rock down into its small particles that form soil there are a lot of factors that affect the type of parent material or how quickly uh, soil forms uh, topography is certainly one of those features that, that affects soil formation. Topography is, is a region's surface feature. So whether land is flat or, or rolling hills or steep mountains. And obviously the steeper the land, the more likely erosion occurs. And erosion, even though we typically think of that as being a bad thing, when humans create it, it's a bad thing but erosion is a natural process as well and it's actually necessary to form soil that that erosion occurs the reason the Sierra Nevada mountains up on the top of those mountains are bare rock is because all the soil and rock particles erode downward and create good soil elsewhere so we can look at soil as being composed of four main parts. The mineral particles that come from the parent material or rock, the organic matter, all of the stuff that was once living or currently living, and then water and air. So those are the four main components of soil that we'll talk a little more about. One of the important organic components of soil is hummus or humus. I guess people typically pronounce hummus, the, the food that people eat. But uh, humus is, is partially decomposed organic matter. So when things die, whether it's a leaf off of a plant or an animal, all the different parts of the environment, the decomposers, break it down into hummus ultimately. And hummus, or humus, is what gives soil its kind of loose, spongy texture. We call that friability. Hummus also has an important uh, role in helping get water into the soil and hold it in the soil so plants can use it. But it also helps in creating little pockets of air, little spaces around particles that can hold air and of course both of those are, are important and necessary for plants plants need water but the plant roots also need air as well as being important for all the other things that live in soil like everything else in nature we can see that there is a, an order or, or or an organization that we can see if we look closely and soil certainly is uh, is organized into layers or what we call horizons and those layers extend from very far deep below the surface of the earth down to where we get to that pet parent material that rock upward through the, the the sea horizon where we have the parent material that's being broken down into smaller chunks above that a horizon the B horizon that we call the subsoil layer so it's the area below the soil the actual soil that plants need for survival this area contains um, litter and, and nutrients and minerals the layer above that the a horizon is the topsoil. this is typically the 
the layer that we most associate with, with plant growth. Having good topsoil means we've got you know, good productive soil. Nice dark soil usually means that it's got a lot of good nutrients in it, good fertile soil. So that's the A horizon. Lots of organic matter, which again, feed the plants. And then the layer immediately above that, which is the layer that we see when we look at the ground, is the organic layer, the O horizon. So this is the layer where all the, the living material accumulate uh, as it dies. The humus, the litter from the plant, meaning the leaves and, and parts of the plants as they die. And as they slowly start decomposing, they're slowly incorporated into that topsoil. Now it's easy to see these horizons on the image on the right because they are colored intentionally to make them stand out. It's a lot harder to, uh, to really see these horizons until you start really knowing what you're looking for. The image on the left you can see right near the top a slightly different colored layer and then below that a darker red layer and then kind of below that um, a layer that gets a little paler and you can see how that corresponds to the image on the right with the little brackets there. So knowing um, the horizons and uh, ultimately the, the type of parent material give us a pretty good indicator um, among other things on how productive a soil is to help us know what we uh, what we can best use it for or if it's soil that might be prone to problems that we should maybe take care of, not use. The living things in the soil are also a very important part of soil. These are usually things that are underground, so we don't see them. And that's one of the challenges, I guess, that a lot of people have with understanding soil, is all we ever see is the very top of it, unless we're looking at the side of a hill that's eroded away. But what's really interesting, again, are all of the different interactions among living things that are in the soil. The roots of the plants, insects, all kinds of insects, other animals like moles and gophers that live underground, the role they have in, in kind of mixing the soil, um, other species that live underground and, uh, and maybe just live in the dens that other things have made to the microscopic things, the bacteria, the fungi that are important decomposers to keep cycling nutrients, and algae, nematodes, protozoa, all microscopic things that all have very important roles in, uh, in keeping that soil healthy. Soil has, uh, has a lot of ecosystem services that it specifically provides. I mean, again, the big one is without soil, we wouldn't have plants. And without plants, there wouldn't be life on this planet. But certainly, um, the soil organisms themselves keep soil fertile by keeping nutrients cycling and, and, and decomposing, by helping minimize the chance of soil erosion, by even breaking down toxic things that get into the soil. A lot of the different living organisms in the soil are very good at detoxifying natural or even in some cases man-made things that get into the soil. Certainly the physical aspects of soil as well as all of the living things take that surface water like rain or runoff and as that water percolates through the soil it's clean. So that ultimately when it gets down into an aquifer, it's clean water. And then of course, decomposing um, organic material is another very important ecosystem service that soil organisms fulfill. We mentioned when we were talking about nutrient cycling that some of the cycles occur in the soil or they start in the soil. Um, but in a bigger picture, the minerals that are in the soil that are taken up by plants, and then those plants are eaten by animals, then that animal eventually dies, and then those organisms decompose that living thing, 
once it's died, get those minerals back into the soil. So um, again, very important part of nutrient cycling. And as we've already mentioned, the two primary um, things that have the biggest role in this are the bacteria and the fungi. But then of course, as far as the rock cycle goes, the actual weathering of parent material, that cycle also plays a very important role ultimately in developing soil and allowing for cycling. So again, just a, an image that shows some of these soil organisms. Notice how most of the living things, um, well really all of the living things are in the O horizon and the A horizon. Once we get down into the subsoil and certainly down into the parent material, there may be minerals and things, but the living things pretty much don't live below the, uh, the A horizon. So the biggest challenges that we face with, um, with soil is basically using it sustainably, you know, doing a good job of conserving it, using it wisely. So basically sustainable soil use is the wise use of our soils without decreasing their fertility so that basically that soil will be productive for future generations, basically again forever. Whether that soil is used for agricultural crops or grazing animals or producing timber or, or just keeping the environment healthy. So again, soil is, is every bit as important to air and water on this planet for humans ultimately. And the biggest challenges that we face in being sustainable is, is improper agricultural use, creating excess soil erosion, depleting the resources from mining, and then polluting the soil based on uh, some of the, the different things that we dump into the environment. Other poor management as well, it, especially in the past, but it, you know, improper logging that creates soil erosion definitely um, was not sustainable in the past. So there are, there are a lot of other things, but ultimately they can be tied back to, to these, these specific challenges. So, soil erosion is defined as the wearing away or the removal of soil from the land, moving it from one place to another. And again, I mentioned that it is a natural process that's very important to soil formation. But when we as humans do things that speed up erosion beyond the natural level that would have been caused prior to us being here, then we can create a situation that depletes the soil. So wind and water always naturally move soil. But when we don't do a good job of managing our soil by unsound logging, poor farming, building roads or, or uh, clearing land for other human uses, that's when we can really cause problems that uh, that might take a long, long time to fix. And then of course this erosion, when it's happening at a higher rate than normal, typically the sediment, the soil will get into streams, lakes, rivers, and affect the water quality and ultimately the habitat for fish and other um, things that live in the water. And then when you add to that chemicals, uh, that run off into these waterways, pesticides, fertilizers, industrial chemicals, uh, then we just compound the problem to the point where sometimes we completely kill off all life in our streams and rivers. So ultimately keeping plants growing on soil limits erosion. Again, even naturally there, there is erosion. Things happen that create bare soil naturally and so that's that's normal but again it's where we speed the process up 
that becomes the problem. Just like air pollution is, is anything that affects the quality of the air, soil pollution is any physical or chemical change in the soil that it, uh, adversely affects the health of the plants and other living things that occur in the soil, on the soil or in the soil. These pollutants also tend to, um, if they get in the soil, they also tend then to create water pollution because again they're going to flow into the rivers, lakes and streams. They also tend to create problems with our groundwater because again they'll percolate through the soil into the groundwater and because they can evaporate and get pushed back into the atmosphere they can create problems with air pollution as well. So there are a lot of pollutants, a lot of them originate as agricultural chemicals as far as soil pollutants, but again there are a lot of other things that we use to manufacture products that get into the soil as well. Everything from salts and petroleum products to heavy metals like mercury and lead. If we look worldwide at all of the dry land area, to put it in perspective, about 6% of the surface of the earth is frozen, about 10% of the earth's soil is too wet to be able to grow uh, food on it, about 22% of the soil is just not thick enough, not deep enough to support uh, agricultural crops. About 23% of it uh, has some sort of chemical problem, too salty, too much uh, salt content, for example. About 28% of the soil on the surface of the earth is just too dry. So we think of all the desert areas, for example. And so that leaves only about 11% of all the surface of the earth that falls within the suitable range for us to actually be able to use it for agricultural purposes. So again, just kind of keep that number in mind. It'd be one thing if every square inch on the, on the Earth's surface was suitable for agriculture, but it's not. And then of that 11%, keep in mind not all of that land is equally suitable for agriculture. Some of it is very productive and some of it is, is not really productive at all. We may use it to grow crops, but it's not nearly as productive as some of the other land might be. So we've got to do a good job of conserving the land that we do focus on for agriculture and do a good job of rebuilding those soil resources as they become used. The amount of degradation to our soil certainly varies um, around the world. And you might think by looking at this chart, if you didn't know better, that North America might be um, an area that actually would have less soil degradation because we have the money, because we have the expertise to do a good job. And again, don't get me wrong, we, generally speaking, do a really good job now of conserving our soil. But we, among the... Um, the other continents have a, um, as far as the percentage of land area that has soil degradation, um, we actually have the lowest amount. So again, I, I think I was setting that up to go the wrong way. This graph um, lists the percentage of total land area that has degraded soil. So the smaller number on here is better. And again, as you would expect, because of, of the science and uh, the, the, the knowledge we have, we do a much better job of protecting our soil than um, any of the other continents do. Oceania, kind of the, um, the Australian area of the world, South America is worse. Europe tends to have the greatest percentage of degraded soil compared to the total land mass. So again, as you would expect, 
um, developed countries, particularly those like us who who have the money and the technology and the knowledge, do a better job of taking care of our soil. And the way we do that, the way we take care of our soil, is by using the appropriate conservation practice based on the land and what we're trying to get from it. So using the uh, soil appropriately and using the proper techniques with how we manage that soil, keep it productive and stable and sustainable. And so we'll look at each of these um, practices in a little bit of detail. So conservation tillage is a way that we cultivate the ground where basically we use the residue from last year's crop. You can see in this image the brown stuff, the stubble from the crop we grew last season is left. And all we do is um, cultivate a very specific little spot, the row where we um, plant the new uh, crop of, of seeds. So we don't go in and, and disc the entire field and uh, disturb all of the soil if we're using conservation tillage. Typically we might use something that's called a no-till drill something basically that literally pokes itself in the ground and, and drops a seed in there. And so we're not needing to disc again. We don't need to disc the entire field. We only disturb the soil very minimally, just enough to get a seed in the ground. And again, this, this typically will, will work pretty well for certain types of crops in certain types of area. We're leaving ground cover so that the soil is still held in place and then as that new crop grows up then um, obviously it takes over and uh, hopefully produces uh, food or, or whatever we're trying to grow. Another conservation method is called crop rotation. There are instances especially in the past where we would grow the same crop year after year after year if it was the one that, that, that paid the most money. And, and there are still lots of instances where you'll see typically a, a crop growing in the same field year after year after year. But to best conserve our soil, if we plant different crops in that field over a period of years, we can have a lot of benefits. One is that if we plant a crop that takes a lot of nitrogen out of the soil, something like cotton for example and then if we plant cotton again next year but the third year we plant something else like alfalfa alfalfa happens to be a nitrogen fixer so it puts nitrogen naturally back in the soil and we grow it as a green manure we grow it maybe we cut it for hay um, and then maybe near the end of the season we just disc it into the ground like a, like a fertilizer so by rotating different crops, we're, we're utilizing um, the ability to not totally deplete the soil if a crop like, for example, again, cotton is, is very demanding of nitrogen in the soil. If we are farming on land that, that is hilly, then we can plow the land in a way that matches the natural contour. And that way, if we're plowing with the contour, not up and down the contour, that is naturally going to help um, minimize the potential for erosion to occur. So just following the natural contours if we're not on perfectly flat land. Another uh, example would be strip cropping. It's another type of contour farming but basically, instead of just planting one crop, we're going to alternate strips of different crops, still following the contour of the land, though. Again, growing two different crops to maximize the diversity and, um, you know, again, get, get maximum benefit from that land. 
Another type of contour plowing, if we have really steep t terrain, is called terracing. We don't need to do a lot of terracing in this country because typically if we have really steep land, we just don't typically farm it. But if you're living in another country and the land you have access to is steep, then pretty much you have no um, option but to farm it. And one way that uh, those folks can minimize the erosion is by creating these stair-step looking platforms so that again you don't have one long slope going down the side of a mountain where when it rains it can just carry soil down with it. You've got this series of stair steps where each one of those stair steps basically helps stabilize the space above it and again if you've got crops growing on the flat part of those stairs then they're gonna um, help serve to keep that soil in place. I actually um, saw something on TV even in some areas where you have terracing it's almost a yearly event where the farmers will go down to the bottom of the terraces and either by hand or with the aid of a farm animal they'll haul the soil back up the side of the terraces every year or every few years in areas where there's still soil erosion occurring. Imagine the amount of work that takes on top of the farming to have to carry the soil back up the hill every year or every few years. Well, again, soil erosion is, is bad and we do everything we can to minimize it but there are still instances where erosion occurs and it can keep getting worse and worse unless we find a way to stop it. So we um, have over, over decades now developed a variety of ways to reclaim soil. Certainly the bottom line is that any place where there's bare soil the first thing we have to do to stop erosion is to stabilize the land and that has to involve getting plants growing because again it's the roots of the plants growing in the soil that keep it from moving keep the soil from moving if erosion has been really bad then another part of this is going to be to get that soil back to its former level of fertility and again that really just is a matter of time once we get those plants growing again we can add the humus back into there. We can add um, other um, things that are missing ultimately to improve the nutrient and the, the ability of that soil to hold water for those plants. And then we can uh, create future problems from coming back by uh, minimizing the effects of erosion, not only the water erosion that would occur We've taken care of that if we've got plants growing again, generally speaking. But if we have areas that are prone to wind erosion, then we can solve that problem by planting shelter belts, rows of trees or shrubs even, that are planted around an area to slow the wind down so that wind doesn't have the ability to carry soil away with it. This whole process of fixing um, a piece of land is a very slow delicate process. If the soil is going to be used again before it's completely restored we may then push it over the edge to where it may not be able to recover. So we, we can't expect to you know spend a couple of weeks or a couple of months to fix the problem and then we can go back in there and, and do what we were doing before. It could take years or decades in some cases to fix the problem and to get the, the soil back to being healthy. Again, as always, um, ultimately legislation may be necessary to solve some of our environmental problems. 
and the Farm Bill Act of uh, 1985, which is uh, currently in the process of being renewed or revised, I think that might have already passed, um, basically contained two main programs that were dedicated towards helping conserve soil. The first being the Conservation Compliance Program, where if you were a farmer or a rancher and you owned land that was deemed as being highly erodible, typically steep land, for example, you had to have a five-year plan that included ways that you were going to control erosion. So that was a law. You had to have a plan in place on how you were going to manage erosion. And then the other major program, the Conservation Reserve Program, was a voluntary program, but it was a way that um, farmers or ranchers could be subsidized for not growing crops on land that was highly erodible. So it basically provided an incentive that if a farmer or rancher planted native grasses or trees, something to, you know, something permanent to keep the soil in place, and they retired that land for a minimum of 10 years. Retirement means they couldn't graze it they couldn't grow crops on it, uh, they couldn't harvest hay off of it, they had to leave it alone, let nature um, you know, take care of it for a while once they planted it, that they would be able to receive money as an incentive for not growing food or grazing that land. And this has been a very successful program going back to, to the Farm Bill in 85. It's estimated that that program has reduced soil erosion by 90% by itself. Not only that, but also then, very importantly, provides habitat for wildlife. Wildlife that might not have been able to utilize an area on a farm because it was focused on growing food crops now would have land that was set aside and that they could utilize. But then also, of course, having permanent vegetation provides for a, a better uh, a system for water to percolate into the soil. Minimizing erosion then benefits all of the living, excuse me, all of the living things in the nearby streams and rivers. So it served to enhance fish populations as well as the overall health of those streams. So again, some very important programs um, again, whether or not you agree with um, uh, farmers being subsidized, paid to not grow food, the bigger picture here that, that the government believed was at play was to encourage them to be able to have their land just be valuable for something other than just food for at least a minimum of 10 years. Once that time was up, they could put that land back into production and maybe then even take another piece of land out of production for a while and let it take some time to heal or recover itself. 